you stand with me, please? And, you know, regarding stand up, sit down, you just sit down when you're ready. So it, there's, there's no rules. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God and we'll go back to water into wine water you turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness into the darkness you shine amen and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our god chorus our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god Lord Jesus, we've declared in our music, we've declared with this song that there is no one like you. We declare that of all the religious, supposed religions in the world, you are the only God and all other gods are false. You are the only true God. And we worship you, Jesus Christ, God the Son, this morning. And we pour onto you our praise and our honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being so real and so precious to us today. Thank you. You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself with frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you but you let me hear your voice calling me and i'm forever grateful to you i'm forever grateful for the cross i'm forever grateful to wait for me to draw near to you but you clothe yourself with frail humanity you did not wait for me to cry out to you but you let me hear your voice calling me and I'm forever grateful to you is that true? I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost that you came. That
that you came to seek and save the lost. Friends, how many here today have been found for many years by the Lord? How many, for, for many years, you say, I've been found. <laughs> it was a long time ago when my life was changed and I was born again. And sometimes it's easy for us who have been part of God's kingdom for a long time to remember this. It's Jesus Christ that went out and sought you. He bought the right to save you from your sins by his shed blood. What an amazing truth. May the Lord remind us again today. This song goes along that line. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain.
we all have loved ones who have gone beyond the river and they're on the other side. My father's one of them. What a wonderful rest. What a wonderful rest that will be. But while we're still here, the Lord knows we need rest. <laughs> we need rest for our souls because there's so many attacks that come upon us. And so I pray collectively here today, Lord Jesus, would you bring us to a place of rest? Would you help us to rest in you? Would you help us to have confidence in you, in your control, in your knowledge, your foreknowledge of all the things that are happening in our lives? And the things that we are tempted to fear, Lord, may we rest in you today. So we are asking for that, that gift. Spirit of the living God, you bring new life to me. Spirit of the living God, flow like a river through me. That's what we need. Spirit of the living God, you bring new life to me. Amen. Spirit of the living God, please flow through a river through me. River flow free, flow like a river with streams of life, setting your people free, mm -hmm. setting your people free, setting your people. is satisfied within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings better is one day better is one day in your courts better is one day thousands elsewhere better is one day in your house is one day in your house better is one day in your courts the thousands elsewhere the thousands elsewhere yes that's true it's true one thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Yes. One thing I ask, 
and I would see to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts the thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. We declare that, Father, to be the truth today. Better is one day just to sit with you in quietness and in peace than thousands elsewhere, Lord, thousands elsewhere. May we continue to find you to be satisfying. Oh, Father, help us not to go without because we won't come, because we won't kneel, because we won't take time. Father, we glorify you today, and we thank you for the banquet table that you provide for your children. And we are choosing to come. We're choosing to come and be with you, Jesus. Oh, we honor you, Lord, and we praise you today. We praise you, Jesus, today. We intercede now on behalf of the needs of others. We think of the wildfires in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and in our country today. So many lives are being threatened and property and wildlife. Lord God, we pray that you would come and you would bring rain upon our land. Rain upon our land in abundance, Father. Lord God, the drought that is taking place across the prairies. Lord, we thank you that you're the God of creation. We look to you now and we ask on behalf of so many people that are deeply impacted and affected, would you, Lord God, be the salvation of our land, not just our people? So we acknowledge you today in this regard. We know this is this is so easy for you. And in the midst of it, Lord, if you're wanting to teach us something, we're open to the lessons. Perhaps you're teaching us that we've got to continue to depend upon you for even the air we breathe, for the land that we, we, we trod upon. Lord, we, we acknowledge you today. And Father God, we think of the needs of our own assembly here today. We thank you that you were also interested so dearly and so tenderly in the lives of so many and today we we bring before these names and some who may be online today or are not familiar with our congregation uh, let we pray uh, their hearts still resonate and may they be in unison even as we pray together as a congregation here as we remember our brothers and sisters that are precious to us we think of jerry baker and elizabeth uh, urban we thank you for john and sharon koala who are with us here today after six months of being ill and homebound. Thank you, Lord God, you have sustained them and kept them, and they are here today by the grace of God. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in their lives and what you're continuing to do. We give you praise. We pray for Ruth Potts and Leonard Shellerton. Lord, we remember Marcy Bruner and Catherine Maybroda, her daughter and her son as well, who need your hand of touch upon them. We pray for Sue and Dieter's little grandson, who was born premature. He's healthy. He's eight weeks early. He's in the neonatal hospital at the U of A. We pray in the name of Jesus. He has a destiny upon his life. You brought him into this world early. But we pray you allow that little body to grow strong every day. And we pray for sustenance and strength to be his portion. Bless his mother and father and the entire family, Lord God. We thank you, we give you praise for all these things that you have done and are doing. And now, Lord, even as Jess has reminded us this morning, there are some amongst our congregation, those that are viewing online, that there have been troubles and challenges that have come into many people's lives. There are people that are lonely. There are people that are emotionally distraught. There are people who are emotionally troubled. 
So much has come as a result of even the months that we've lived through. They don't hurt physically, but Lord God, they are troubled in their minds and hearts. You know every single one of them, Lord. You know every detail of their lives. And we pray now on behalf of each one that might have the peace of the Lord that, uh, that uh, uh, goes past understanding and might they know the wonderful hand of God upon their lives. Pray as well this morning for the lives that are troubled, those that are distraught even in homes across our city today. Lord, we pray for a wonderful miracle of healing in our city and in the families and the lives of people. May peace abound in the city of Edmonton. May it be a place where the Prince of Peace is not just spoken of in name, but is lived out in our hearts. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing us today for these things and much more that we could not speak publicly because of confidentiality, but you know about all of those needs. And we thank you now and we give you all the praise for your good and great and mighty God, worthy to be praised. And from grateful hearts, we say, thank you, Lord. Even before we see the answers, our faith, our faith is exercised and we say thank you. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name, we pray all these things and everyone agreed. Amen. 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 Before we do anything more, could you just take a moment and get on your feet and would you, would you greet one another in the Lord today? And if there's a, a visitor or someone you don't know, take a moment to say hello to them and to greet them. Would you do that as you rise to your feet and greet one another this morning? Well, we are blessed to be part of the family of God and be part of this local church and to be part of the, the church of Jesus Christ that is meeting all around the world today. Some started hours and hours ago on the Lord's Day in some other part of the world and, and why we were still sleeping and, and uh, they were praising the Lord. They were just getting warmed up. And uh, here we are. You know, I just got to tell you, it's going to be exciting one day. I can't even imagine it. Can you? What it's going to be like when we all get to heaven. My dad used to say there's going to be a special section just for the Swedes up there because he was Swedish, right? <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know about all of that. All I know is that we're all going to be children of the Lord, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, as the, as the Scripture says. And it's going to be fantastic. I don't know about you, but the older I get, I, I don't like saying goodbye. You know, whether it's temporarily or saying goodbye to someone who's passed, I just, that just, oh, I... I have a hard time with that. I, I know they've gone out to be with Jesus, but still, not been able to go out for coffee with them or whatever the case may be. Just There's just that void. But one day, we're not going to have to do that anymore. No more tears are going to be shed, as the scriptures remind us. No, no more goodbyes. And it's going to be joyful. But well, you're saying, well, like, oh, really? We're going to be together all the time? Well, you know, Lord's going to bless us, so we're going to love being together all the time. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's, it's just wonderful. So... Uh, it's, it's absolutely a delight for us to be joined together today. We want to take a moment to welcome you. If you're visiting with us, what, a, what an absolute honor it is for, for uh, us to have you here at HVA. If, if you are, I'd encourage you, if you could, there are, there are guest cards at the back. And perhaps before you uh, leave today, if you don't mind just filling one of those out, we will protect that information very, very carefully. And, and closely, but we do want to take opportunity through that just to thank you for being with us and to extend our gratitude for your being here. God bless you. And to all of those of you who come on a regular basis, Lord bless you. Can I ask you to do one thing before you leave today? I want you to, I want you, those that come on a regular basis, make a point of looking out for those that are visiting. Would you do that? And just go up and say hi, shake their hand, give them your name, and, and before they head out the door, just make them feel even a little extra welcome besides our welcome here today. We thank you, and so thank you so much. Also want to take a moment to extend a 50th wedding anniversary to Pastor Bob and Karen Gow, who are part of our congregation. They're away right now enjoying their 50th anniversary. I can hardly believe 50 years that they've been married. When I was, when I was younger, I used to think uh, people who celebrated the 25th were a bunch of old people. And then I hit 25 and I went, I'm not old. What's that all about? What's that all about? I was thinking about that yesterday. 50, wow, that's an accomplishment. Before long, I'll be there. I'll be going like, that's just for old people. Well, I'll be there. So old my wife, by the way. <laughs> 
she's come along on the journey with me. Thank you so much. And so we congratulate Bob and Karen on our 50th. Also, want to say uh, congratulations to Sue and Dieter uh, Lucius, who had their first little grandson born on Friday. Now, <clears throat> he decided he wanted to come early rather than late. So he came eight weeks early, and he's in the neonatal uh, unit being cared for. He is in good health, but as you can appreciate, uh, that's eight weeks early, and so he's getting good care at the University of Alberta Hospital. And we congratulate Sue and Dieter and all of the family on that wonderful arrival. Isn't it great to be able to have new ones come into our families? Isn't it great? I love it. It's beautiful, and so we extend our congratulations to them. And also, happy birthday to Pastor Philip. God bless you. Trust you had a great birthday yesterday. Well, we are... Thankful that we can come together like this every Sunday here at Heritage Valley Assembly at Taylor Seminary. And also for those of you who are coming to us online, we always have regular viewers from Northern Ireland. So hello to Northern Ireland this morning. God bless you. I trust the day is going well for you. And uh, we have been involved this past summer uh, in a summer series that we've, we've called uh, God's Wisdom for Today. As we've, looked at, as we've studied and are studying the book of Proverbs. And the last couple of Sundays, it's been a joy to be able to just give an overview and then to, uh, to bunker down into Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, about trusting in the Lord in all of our ways and, and in all of our ways acknowledging him, he, he shall direct our paths. And it's been blessed to be able to share those truths. And this morning, I'm asking one of my pastoral colleagues, Pastor Matthew, to come, and he's going to be sharing with us further from the book of Proverbs. And so, uh, Pastor Matthew, as you come, God bless you as you share the word of God here this morning. God bless you. I love you. You're the best. God bless. Amen. C.E. McCartney once said this, that after, after a minister had preached a, a searching sermon on pride, a woman who had heard the sermon waited for him and, until, in, and, until he was done. And, and she was in much distress. Her mind was in distress. And, and, she would like to, and she told him that she would like to confess a sin. The minister asked her what the sin was. She answered, the sin of pride. For I, I, I have sat for an hour before my mirror some, some, some days ago admiring my beauty. Oh, re re responded the minister, that was, that was not the sin of pride. That was a sin of imagination. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, this morning we are doing a... Uh, well, today, sorry. Today my sermon is titled Pride versus Humility. The Bible talks a lot about pride and humility and how they are both opposites, both extreme opposites, and they're always warring against each other. Well, he, he, um, pride is always trying to overshadow humility. And it makes sense why King Solomon talked so much about uh, not just pride, but also money, fear of the Lord, wisdom, discipline, and so on and so forth. Because they're all great things that we need to learn, we need to have understanding of, we need not to do the wrong thing. In the book of Proverbs, there are Great little one to two liners, you know, if you read them, they're just like, oh, that's so good. Oh, there's another one. It's so good. They're short, but they're so powerful. Like these ones on pride. Proverbs 21, verse 23. It says, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Ooh. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Hmm. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Good, good, uh, just very short, you know, like they're, they're short, but they're powerful. And we can learn so much about them from the Proverbs. And then, of course, there's also other scriptures as well throughout the rest of the Bible, throughout the rest of, um, uh, you know, uh, like, for instance, in James, James verse 4, 6. This shows us how God feels about pride. You, you know, you ask, how does God feel about pride? How does he feel about someone who has pride inside their heart? Look at this, James 4, 6. 
God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As well as Psalm 138, verse 6, uh, in, in, in the New King James Version. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. So from this, we see clearly how God feels about pride. He doesn't like it, and he opposes them, and they are distant from him. God does not like it when people are filled like this. It's offensive to him. It's detestable to him. And throughout the scriptures, we see many other examples, many examples of pride in people's lives. Just searching this up, uh, I was doing a search on Logos, and I found this massive book that's called The Dictionary of Bible Themes, written by Martin H. Manser. He delves into the detail, compiling all the scriptures and taking it, and, and, and um, all the scriptures that even reference pride. And so here it is break, broken down, but of course I'm not going to show all the scriptures because there's, there's, there's too many, but... First one is pride in status. We see this in the scriptures with Pharaoh in Exodus 5, 2, where he said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, verse 13, it says, And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all, all, all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. And then in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 25, it says that King Hezekiah, he had pride in his heart. Um, have, you, have you guys ever been like that, where, where you have so much possession things that you made and you start showing everybody around the house? I know I have done that, so. <laughs> Matthew 23, verse 6 to 7. It says this about, about the Pharisees. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and, greeting, and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. In Acts 8, 9, we see Simon the magician as well, where it says, But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city, and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. There is also the pride in strength. Goliath shows this pride in 1 Samuel 17, 42. And when the Philistines looked and sorry, and when the Philistine, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy, or ruddy, I don't know how to say it, two D's, I don't know, I think it's ruddy, and handsome in appearance. In Daniel 4.30, God gave King Nebuchadnezzar one year to repent. But instead of repenting, at the end of verse 30, it's, it, it says this. He, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar says, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately he's driven out, and after a time... He then acknowledges uh, that it is God and not him. Pr um, pride and wisdom, Romans 1.22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no one deceive you. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Oof, man. I tell you, these are good nuggets in Scripture. There is pride in ambition. This is interesting. There's only two examples of this throughout the Scriptures of pride in ambition. The first one is Satan. In Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, it says, this is Satan, 
You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself the most high, like the most high. Disgusting when you hear that, when you hear someone talking like that. And that's the devil. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4, this is the Antichrist's ambition now. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so good God or, or object of worship, so that he, retake, so that he takes this, his seat in the temple of God in proclaiming himself to be God. And spiritual pride. This is from Isaiah 65, verse 5. Who, who say, keep to yourself, do not, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Jesus warned against spiritual pride in Matthew 6, 2. Actually, quite a bit in Matthew 6. Thus when, you went, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And Matthew 6, 16, on fasting. When you fast, do not look gloomy like, like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And lastly, to the church of Laodicea. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched. Pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And as I said, there's much more to this. I could have shortened this more, but it's just, ah, it's too good, you know, to look at all these different examples in the scriptures. I, I couldn't shorten it. It was just... And, and, and again, um, from, the, from the same book, the Dictionary of Bible Themes, that this uh, uh, Martin H. Manser has... He also shows what the end result is of well, uh, uh, like what happens with someone who has pride. What is the end result of a person who has pride? Well, there is self-deception, spiritual blindness, a hard heart, a malicious spirit, contempt for others, quarreling, violence, injustice, oppression, contempt for God. In other words, its end is ruin and destruction. C.S. Lewis once said, that pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is taking which is rightfully God's and keeping it for yourself. It is uplifting oneself instead of God. It is putting yourself before God. It is taking the spotlight away from God. It is eclipsing God, over outweighing God. It is robbery. It is the spirit of pride that would say, I don't need God. I don't need him. If you have ever been addicted or, or, or are addicted to pornography or something like it, pride will often say to you, I don't need someone's help. I can do this my own. I don't need someone to help me. I personally know of a story of two mentors who were trying to mentor someone who is severely addicted to porn. And um, one, one day, this guy said to them that he didn't need their help anymore, that he felt he should do this on his own. And the mentors tried to convince him over and over and over again, like, no, you need help. You cannot do this on your own. You, like, we need to help you. We need to keep you accountable, so on and so forth. And he said, no, I don't need your help. I don't need porn blockers. I don't need all this stuff. I need, I need to do this on my own. The root of this is pride. It is pride that pulls the blinders down on someone and convinces them that they don't need anyone else. They don't need God. They can do this on their own. You will never be free until you acknowledge that you truly cannot do this on your own. It's impossible. You need help. In humility, you say, I need help. 
It is the same way with our sin and our lives. Pride keeps us from receiving salvation from Christ. It is pride that, that keeps saying, no, I don't need, you know, I don't need to be forgiven. What have I done? For the scripture says that all have sinned, all have fallen short, short of the glory of God. In order to be saved from, his sin, or from our sin, we need to put our pride off to the side and humbly come before the Lord and acknowledge, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I need cleansing. I need to repent, Lord. I repent of my sin. I need you to come into my life. I acknowledge that you are my Savior. I acknowledge that you are Lord. You are who you say you are in the scriptures, that you rose from the dead. I need you in my life, Lord. And the moment you do this, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. But pride turns the focus from God and places it on ourselves and uplifting ourselves instead of God. In this day and age, it is very popular to celebrate one's pride. Um, as I was creating the sermon, there was... I was just like, I, I have to go this direction. Because especially in the summertime, you see a lot of pride flags out there. It's, it's all over the place. They celebrate it, but pride, as we see in the scriptures, it's nothing to be celebrated. It's an abomination towards God. Now, what does the rainbow actually mean? Let, let, let's just take a look at this. What does the rainbow mean? In Genesis 9, right after the global flood had subsided... God declared this, and God said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living, every living creature of the flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, you, and I, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all, of all flesh that is on the earth." very repetitive as, as you'll see because God's making it very clear what why he's doing this and that he remembers to never flood the world again now if you do a word study if you do a world word study on the word bow in Hebrew the bow the bow literally means God's archery bow God's armor like like weapon his weapon that's what the word actually means so he, he, um, this giant bow that was his weapon that he used to flood the world, which is hard, hard to imagine, but like, j j just imagine with me, like God stretching out his bow and, psh, and then the world floods. I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how it went, but th it means his weapon. And then he placed it in the sky, down on the sky, where it sits today in the spiritual realm, in the supernatural realm, and reappears whenever the sun rays shine through the raindrops. In other words, science, but really it's supernatural. It is there to remind us that God will never flood the world again with water. When I see that rainbow, that bow, I, 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 like when I know this now, now that I know this information, I got no pride in me when I look at that. Pride escapes me. Instead, I'm just, I'm just marveled. I'm humbled. I'm like, wow, God, that's your weapon that you, that you use to actually flood the whole world. And that's your promise laid down saying that you will never use it again because it, it, it's your covenant between us that you will, never, you will never send a worldwide flood again. It's amazing when I see that. There's no pride whatsoever. But you know what? It's just like the devil. It's just like the devil. The devil loves to take what God makes and twists and distorts it around so that it is the opposite. For example, uh, number one, creation. God, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, the uh, devil takes it 
and says that it happened by chance. All things came to be and just by chance and convinces people to worship creation instead of the creator. Number two, creation of the very first two humans on the planet. Devil takes it and says, ah, there's nothing special about us. We just came from a bunch of monkeys and that we have no value. And then he seeks to try and kill and distort humans uh, whom we were created in his image. We were created in God's image. And so the devil tries to distort that. He wants to try and, and kill us, kill that image through ways of like war, abortion, immorality, mental illness, suicide, and on and on and on. Number three, God creates and blesses sex. The devil takes sex and distorts it and draws people into sexual immorality. And four, same with the gifts of the Spirit and signs and wonders. The devil loves to copy it and make, it, make his own versions of it. You see it, replicas of it in, in false religions and satanic worship. The devil loves to copy. Same goes for the rainbow. God created it for a reason, and the devil takes it and makes it his own. When God created the rainbow, he created it with seven colors. Seven colors. Seven in the Bible means completeness. For instance, seven days in a week. Seven trumpet judgments. Seven bowl judgments. Seven, seven seal judgments. Seven thunders. Seven churches, and on and on. But in the pride flag, there are six colors. Six in the Bible means man, for God created man on the sixth day, as well as, as Revelation. Mark of the beast, six, six, six. Three sixes, the, it's the symbolic of the Trinity, but Antichrist Trinity. So the, the, the pride flag is about uplifting man instead of God. We see how Satan takes what God makes and distorts it. Now, this, may, this is just me. This, is, this may sound silly to you. That's fine. I'm not telling you to do this. This is just me. But when I see a, a, a product that I'm trying to buy and has a rainbow on it, I, I'm, always, I'm always counting the colors, making sure there's seven colors. Seven colors, okay, I'll buy that. If it's six, I don't buy it because that, that's not the real rainbow. That's just me. <laughs> but we must remember that rainbow is God's and it is holy. It is his. He used it to judge this whole world with his holy and righteous wrath against sin. Back in about 2016 and 17, um, I was speaking at a Baptist teen camp, and, and um, I, I, it was me and a few other speakers, and healings were breaking out. I've never seen the Holy Spirit move so strongly in all my life. And it was a Baptist camp, and um, I saw kids who were, came from abused backgrounds, foster homes, stuff like that. They didn't know Christ. And they're, in, they're, they're, they're they're, 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 coming to, they're, they're coming to Jesus. They're being impacted by the Holy Spirit. They're being slain in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and so on. And now, um, uh, I know I probably told this story about three years ago, just FYI. So if you heard this before, you heard it. But just bear with me. Now, I come there to this, to this camp meeting, and I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a Pentecostal guy, you know. So I'm like, okay. I want to look proper in, in front of this Baptist church. This is before all the miracles were breaking out. And so I kept telling myself, I want to look dignified. I want to look proper be, before them. I want to look good. And I didn't realize that I had pride inside of me. I wanted to look good for them. I didn't realize that was pride. Uh, or in the Greek, it is fusio. I had fusio coming out of me. I was just prideful. So the service started and... I told the Lord, I'm not going to say Holy Ghost or revival, nothing like that. I was going to preach my sermon. I started preaching, and all of a sudden, I'm just feeling the move of the Spirit, and I just start going off script and talking about how we need, we need an old Holy Ghost revival once again, just like with John and Edwards and George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. And I'm like, what am I saying? And then all of a sudden, the, the Holy Spirit just comes upon me so strongly and I'm trying to stay, stay strong and all of a sudden I just I stumble back because if someone pushes me I stumble on the stage I guess you could say semi-slain I came back freaking out I'm like oh I hope nobody saw that I come back to the stage thinking okay I just act like that never happened put my hand on the pulpit like this and it was a skinny pulpit and all of a sudden as soon as I put my hand on it I felt like someone was press, press, pressing me down like there was like the gravity was like just increased and my head went all the way under the pulpit. 
And I cried there uh, for about a minute, two minutes, three minutes, I don't know how long it was, and I just wailed in the microphone. And the whole time I'm having an argument with God. God keeps saying, preach revival, preach revival. I'm like, no, God, I'm not going to preach revival. I want to look good here. I'm, I'm trying to look dignified. Meanwhile, my, my, my whole uh, dignified personality, my whole dignified look is right out the window now. And finally, after a while, I finally said, okay, God, I'll preach revival. Instantly, the weight shoots off of me. I come back up, start preaching what God has told me to preach. I start preaching it. And, and I've, had that, I've had that happen again uh, a few years later. And after these experiences like this, I have come to the realization of, of how God has humbled me this way and teared away my fusio that was coming out of me. I've realized I should not be worried of what other people think about me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be that way. That I should just do what God has called me to do and not worry and try and look proper for people. We must listen and obey the Holy Spirit whenever he tells us to do something. When I preach, I am, I am, I am not here to please you. I'm here to please the Lord. Wherever I go, I'm only there to please the Lord Jesus Christ. You here... We here, we are not here to please each other. We are here to please God. We are not here to look, try and look, oh, I'm going to look good in front of that person. No, we are here to look good in front of God. We are here to please the Lord. For Paul says in Galatians 1.10, For am I, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Who is this about? Is this about other people or is this about God? No, it's about God. We must serve the Lord. It isn't about us. We must not allow our fusio, our pride, to not get in the way of what God wants to do in our lives. Now I know um, some of you may get sick of me always talking about this revival, revival. I'm always the, you know, I got revival flowing out of me. Or always talking about wanting to see the Lord move. I, I, I know I may get tired, but that's just who I am. I'm sorry, but at the same time, I'm not sorry. That's just the way God has, has created me. And so, what if, what if, let's just say, one Sunday, the Lord just took total control of the service. All of our hearts were just open toward, toward him, what he wanted to do. What if the Lord moved in a mighty way in this service? What if, what if people just started repenting of their sins, crying out, cry, laying on the floor, just weeping before the Lord because His presence was so strong in this place? What if people started getting healed, prophesying, speaking in tongues, interpreting in tongues, and so on, just like the book of Acts? What if God started doing something like that? What if you decided to just interrupt the worship and do that? Or interrupt a sermon, my sermon, or, or Pastor Larry's or Philip's? What if the Lord just decided to do that? May our schedule, may our clock never get in the way of what He wants to do. May we never say, oh God, no, we have to close this down a bit, God, because we, we got to keep the time here. We got to carry on. This is looking a little bit too weird now. May none of us get in the way, or fusio get in the way of what God wants to do. I'm not saying throwing out discernment. No, we must still always discern and try and shut down things of the flesh. Obviously, of course. I don't want to see people just, just being pushed over and falling over and faking it. No, I want to see the Holy Spirit genuinely pushing people over. You know what I mean? Like, if someone's getting slain, I want to be genuine. If someone's speaking in tongues, I want it to be genuine. I don't want to see the flesh. So I'm not saying you're throwing away that. No, no. We must discern, of course. But we also must be careful and know that he can do whatever he wants. As long as we have an open heart, an open mind to him. Who am I to tell God that the weird or the strange or the things I don't understand, God, are not of him? If he decides to do something different... Who am I to say that that's not of him? Imagine Moses and the burning bush. What if, like, can you imagine? Moses being like, 
That's not of God. God doesn't do things like that. <laughs> Can you imagine? Or the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, you know, where they're all, act, where the, the people thought they were drunk and they're speaking in tongues. No, God doesn't move like that. You know, I don't know about that. Like, we must, we must be careful to discern. Always look at the fruit. Always look at the fruit. What I mean by that is, does it contradict with God's word? Does it, or, um, you know, if it doesn't, then oh, that's good. And then also, does it produce righteousness in people's lives? Does it lead them towards Christ? Or does it lead them into heresy or something like that? Or, or making God into a drug where we always just only, you know, we just want to have a good time in God. That's not good either. We don't seek to have a good time with God. We seek Him. He can do what He wants. We must not touch His glory. In other words, all the glory belongs to God and not us. I remember in Catherine Coleman's services, um, if you ever watch them, then I always loved how whenever somebody would come up on a stage and they were healed, they would say, it was something that you did, something that you did. She would right away stop everything and she would say, no, Lord, we vow to give you all the glory. And she would make it very clear and definitive. This is not me. This is God. I wish more people would do something like that today, you know. Boy, oh boy. Pride can also, the spirit of pride can also say stuff like, Holy Spirit will only move if I'm there at the pulpit. Or if I'm there praying for that person, you know, God will only do something. No. For the Lord says, no, I do not need you, for I can do it without you. Do you really think that you are that important? Whose glory do you seek, mine or yours? Who do you desire to be famous, me or you? For I will do what I want and use whom I want. For you desire, for you who desire to be used and seek me, but feel so small, I will use, yes, I will use you, says the Lord. He wants to use you. Are you open to him? Or is your fusio in the way? I know that there's other things that can be holding us back from God moving, such as fear and you know, other things like that, but it could also be pride, as in it's stunting our growth. It's stunting our growth in God from us growing, because God finds it detestable, it's disgusting. God distances himself some, away from someone who is prideful. Focus on the Lord. Today we live in such a narcissistic culture where songs are sing, sing, or, you know, singing about us and so on. Sadly, even some worship songs are being, are being uplifting man a lot. I heard a song the other day, a worship song, and I just had to shut it off. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Honestly. You know, Frank Sinatra says, I did it my way. No, I need to do it God's way. I need to do it the Lord's way, not what, my, not what my heart wants to do. God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? May we come in each service on a Sunday morning, always being open to the Lord, having, a, having, having an open heart, a, a pure heart, and asking God, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do? It's not about me. It's not about Pastor Larry, it's not about Pastor Philip or anybody else in this room. It's about the Lord. What does he want to do in our lives? Proverbs, 30, 30, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 says, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. Proverbs 11, verse 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 15.33 says, The fear of the Lord is instruction is in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. You'll notice that those who humble themselves will receive wisdom, they'll be wise, they will be honored, and they'll be close to the Lord. Is pride hindering you? 
your fusio hindering you from getting closer to the Lord, stunting your growth in Christ. Maybe you're crying out to be used of the Lord. You have that desire, but maybe your pride is, is holding you back. It's stunting your growth. If that's you, then, then you need to repent. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to heal you and to open up your heart before the Lord so that you have your mind on Christ and not on yourself. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis once said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Think on the Lord. Put your mind on the Lord. After the service, if, if you need prayer, uh, Pastor Larry and I and Pastor Philip, we would love to pray for you. And, and, and uh, we want to see people set free of this. We want to see people set free of this. This is, it's, 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 oh, I want to see people used of the Lord. I want to see people go farther in the Lord and grow stronger in the Lord. I want to see our church on fire. Returning to, we, I want to see all of our churches returning stronger to the Word, stronger in prayer. And I'm not saying that we aren't. I'm not saying that. But we can always be stronger. We can always be more on fire for God. We need our churches to, to just be on fire for the Lord. Our hearts open. Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to do, Lord? And always having that mind. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, for your conviction. We thank you, Father, that you lead us on a closer walk with thee. Father, if any of us in this room <clears throat> is struggling with pride in their lives, Lord, may you convict them right now in the name of Jesus. Convict them, Father. And Lord, may they repent. And God, may you strip it away from them. Even if it's painful, Lord, humble them. And God, may you protect all of us, including myself, everyone, Father. Protect us, Lord, from pride. Protect us, God, that we would never think of ourselves great. But Lord, you are great. Help us, Lord. Guide us by your Spirit, I pray. May we always have an open mind to you, Father. May our mind always be willing and open to what you want to do, Jesus. And always asking you, what do you want to do? What do you want to do, Lord? I pray that you would have your way. May none of us hinder, Lord, what you want to do. Lord Jesus, we love you. Oh, we love you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Breathe afresh upon us, Lord. Lord, as it says in your word, to draw closer to you and you will draw closer to us. Have your way, Lord Jesus, in this place, I pray. Have your way in our lives, Father. Draw us on a closer walk with you, O oh Lord. May nothing hinder us, Lord. May nothing hinder us in our lives, even if it's media, even if it's being on our phone too much, Lord. Please, Lord, we repent. Convict us, Father. Draw us to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Because he lives, you can face Monday. Because he lives, you can face Thursday night. Let's sing this together. Because he lives. God sent his son. They
second the key. Can we bring it down a little bit? <laughs> How sweet to hold our newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm. That'd be nice. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he Bless you, and we'll see you next time.